he told a probation officer years before he was going to kill, he was going to commit murder. I mean, he was signaling for years his intent. For the very first time, the greatest minds in criminology have come together to dissect the psyches of some of the world's most prolific serial killers. These forensic psychiatrists, psychologists and pathologists have an incredible depth of knowledge and often first-hand insight into these killers, helping us to understand what makes a monster. A clinical forensic psychologist, Dr Cullen has spent much of his career working with dangerous offenders in prisons throughout the UK. Here, Dr Cullen discusses Stephen Griffiths, otherwise known by his self-given nickname, the Crossbow Cannibal, or his MySpace name, Ven Pariah. Caution, the subject matter of this interview contains graphic descriptions and is often very disturbing. Stephen Griffiths, uh, then pariah. Um, unusual in serial killing because there's not very much in his childhood or formative period to suggest uh, the monster that he was to become. Um, relative stability in the family background, nothing of really great signal note as a contributing factor. And we really have to go to his teenage years before we start seeing um, some of the early rather morbid fascination with violence and weapons, especially knives. Um, he also at this stage is beginning to introduce himself to a criminal lifestyle. He experiences Borstal because of violence. He experiences uh, youth custody and then eventually prison for a substantial period because he, he threatened someone with a knife to the throat. Um, and this led progressively in a deterioration of his uh, mental health, I think, until he was sectioned under the Mental Health Act and, and found himself in uh, Rampton, which is a secure mental hospital, where he came under the tender mercy of um, very knowledgeable psychiatrists. And during that period of analysis, um, he was described variously as um, uh, not suitable for treatment, uh, not mentally ill, through to having a severe personality disorder, uh, dangerous, and uh, right the way up to schizoid psychopath. The significance of these various and rather disparate mental health descriptions are that all of them have the same consequences in terms of the implication for psychiatry, and that is that they wash their hands of him. He is not suitable for treatment. Doesn't matter how unstable or dangerous he is, he's simply not in their province, not in their remit, not their responsibility. So Stephen Griffiths, as he still is at this point, moves into a relatively normal world where he has an unhealthy fascination for um, violence and uh, knives in particular. And he begins to feed this uh, with access to the internet and uh, more pornographic and violent uh, information to fuel that. But at the same time, he's struggling, it seems to me, to s try and establish a kind of relatively normal life. He's trying to have relationships with women. They're failing because he already has some of the early signs of uh, mental, obsessional, compulsive behavior. And as soon as these women see this, the relationships fall apart. His, his ego strength is sufficiently fragile in terms of confidence with women that he then turns his back on relationships and increasingly isolates himself. Uh, because of his criminal history as well, I understand that his relationship with his family broken down, so that no longer is also the potential for at least some sort of positive uh, in a, intervention in this, this deterioration of his lifestyle. Stephen Griffiths was convicted of the murders of Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Susan Blamers in Bradford between June 2009 and May 2010. 
The three women were working as prostitutes when Griffiths, who was studying for a PhD in homicide studies at the University of Bradford, picked them up and murdered them at his flat. At this stage in his life, um, he's probably lost. He's probably sufficiently engaged in this isolated inner reality of a morbid, increasingly obsessional fascination with knives and violence and death and the links between them and especially his fascination with and growing respect for serial killing. But he's still sufficiently competent and cognizant to pursue and achieve a first in psychology from the University of Leeds, quite an achievement. So we've still got a man who's functioning in the real world to quite a successful degree. Um, some years pass and unfortunately in this period this, this isolation process continued to the point of pathology. Um, he's obsessed with serial killing and he carries this obsession and his intelligent articulate persona and his first uh, in psychology at Leeds to the University of Bradford where in spite of his history of instability in spite of him having declared to a probation officer that he will kill, he will murder when he's in his early 30s, in spite of previous uh, criminal record of violence and threats with knives, the University of Bradford takes him on as a PhD, PhD student in what subject? Serial killing. This is perfect for Griffiths. This is ideal. He can, with formal, official, academic sanction pursue his pathology. And he's isolated himself now so completely in a flat, he is in his inner world. Supervision for a PhD requires someone to be monitoring not just his progress academically, but the individual. Where was that? It's extraordinary. Extraordinary. So when we look at Griffiths at this stage, and he was now really on the cusp of, uh, of murdering, he's, he's very close to it. And he's also using prostitutes for sex, so he's turned his back on any attempt to have normal relationships. Um, and he's completely now obsessed with serial killing. It's filling his life. And he then kills. And he kills because it is premeditated. Premeditation is fantasist. Premeditation is rehearsal. He has done this deliberately, consciously, as part of the persona that he wishes to be, as part, as part of his, alts, his monstrous, strong, ruthless alter ego. And that's Ben Pariah. He's giving realization to this monster. first killing obviously gives him pleasure. It's successful, it's violent, but it's the second murder that's particularly significant in one other respect, and this is one where he actually films on his uh, mobile phone uh, a gruesome, uh, detailed uh, murder of his second torture and murder of his second victim um, with his own narrative uh, across this this video, this pornographic video that he's made, and then he proceeds to lose that phone on a train. And here we're looking, we're looking at whatever happened to the accountability of other people, because before the police actually managed to trace that phone and get it into their possession, it's been seen by at least three and probably many other people and viewed as pornographic and sold twice not reported to the police, sold for profit by people. Extraordinary. The third murder now, because there's absolutely no constraint on him, he is a serial killer. He is giving full vent to this uh, pariah. The third murder um, is filmed. It's filmed on the CCTV, which the police who had been monitoring Griffiths for two years, 
and who were concerned about him, had asked the, the caretaker to install in the uh, flat area where he lived because they were concerned about an incident. This too is a kind of perverse indictment, but the police have no power to intervene until there's been a crime committed. They can be as concerned as they like about the potential for it, but they can't intervene until it's happened. Um, so there's Griffiths. He's filmed taking a prostitute back to his flat. She tries to escape from him on the CCTV. He comes running out. He, he drags her back in. He kills her with a crossbow. He then goes up to the camera. He, he's fully aware of what's happening. He's filming now. He's infamous. And he gestures to the camera. He goes away and comes back and gestures in contempt to the camera. And this is discovered when the caretaker is reviewing um, this footage in a routine manner. He sees this. And this concerned citizen, having just witnessed this horrific, barbaric murder, phones the police. But before he phones the police, he phones the Sun newspaper to sell his story. Griffiths is um, arrested because this, he's made no attempt, unlike most serial killers, to avoid arrest. He's satisfied. He has, he has come out. He has cast off this weak body of Stephen Griffiths, and he has become uh, the notorious, infamous, potentially famous serial killer that he wants to be. Unlike the vast majority of the cases featured in Making a Monster, Stephen Griffiths didn't seem to have a particularly troubled childhood. So what else is at work here? And what do criminologists like Dr. Cullen look to to help explain Stephen Griffiths' actions? The one thing that I said was conspicuous by its absence was the, the, the traumatic childhood, uh, history of abuse and that sort of thing. But that's not actually particularly relevant to the kind of etiology of this man's torment, his, his serial killer obsession is, his obsession with violence. But I think there's another extremely important thing. I mean, Griffiths ticks a lot of the boxes in terms of the factors that contribute to making up a serial killer. But he actually had... A, I think an incredibly low self-esteem. He had kind of given up on the prospects of Stephen Griffiths having a successful, happy life. And he was putting a lot of his energy into this alter ego, this other persona that was a much stronger, more successful, but ultimately extremely brutal, destructive. And he was going to settle for that. And he was only going to settle for it if it was public. It had to be public. People had to know that uh, Vin Pariah was there. Uh, he had to do that. As soon as he finished, as soon as he was captured, as soon as he had killed successfully, he was finished. And when you see him interviewed by the police, there's not really much left there. I mean, he's still probably enjoying the notoriety and, and the, uh, the potential for him to go down in the annals as one of the great serial, British serial killers, but it's only in that sense. Yeah, it was, it's fascinating because um, he was making attempts, I think, to, see, to, set him, to present an image of being someone of menace, someone of substance, but also someone who was outside the normal convention. I mean, he, was, he had pet lizards that he would go for, take for walks. He would wear black leather. He would slick him, his hair back. He was conspicuous, and yet no one took him seriously. Friends would dismiss him uh, uh, as relatively harmless, uh, which must have galled him because that was... <laughs> That was throwing contempt. That was still seeing the, the Stephen Griffiths character. That was the loser. It's, it's, it's extraordinary that there are no agencies for the Stephen Griffiths of this world. If he sets himself apart from family, if he turns his back on any of the, the social, familial, conventional people who could safeguard, who could intervene, who could help, um, and there are no agencies, no authorities. Psychiatry wash their hands of him. The police can't intervene. He hasn't actually committed an act, a, a crime. Uh, where are social services? Who's responsible? Uh, he told a probation officer years before he was going to kill. 
he was going to commit murder. What happened to that? That's actually an offense. That's, an, that's a threat to kill. And nothing was done. I mean, he was signaling for years his intent. It's extraordinary. And, and it is, uh, this is very judgmental, but in a, it's a kind of indictment of the society in which we live, as were those instances of individual citizens uh, profiting or, or gratuitous, gratuitously selling the, 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 the evidence. It could have been, the third murder could have been in, prevented possibly if people had acted on that, that evidence from the second one. It's, it's an indictment. He gave his name as, as the crossbow cannibal, and he did that to publicize what he wanted to be described as. This is, this is what he wants to be. I am Ven Pariah, the crossbow cannibal. That, that's my signature line now um, that I want you to refer to me as because I am now infamous as a serial killer, and that's the sort of serial killer I am. That's my niche, uh, my particular horrific niche. Um, I use crossbows and I actually cannibalized my victims, and he did. But he needed this, this kind of serial killer niche that's different from other serial killers that identifies him as very special and different and deeply, deeply dangerous and disturbed. Choosing the most vulnerable people is a pattern in serial killing. They usually do. They usually choose children, old people, prostitutes, um, people who are vulnerable, who are outside the protection and guardianship of society. And they do that because, one, they're cowards, uh, and two, they don't want to be caught. Um, it makes it you know, safer for them. It's their safe victims. He lived in proximity to prostitutes. He knew prostitutes. He used prostitutes. It was an obvious target group for him. Could Stephen Griffiths be treated? Well, it's, it's a moot point because he is beyond treatment and has um, forfeited, I think, any right to treatment. Um, he makes a stronger case for capital punishment than treatment. Um, and no, I don't think he's amenable to treatment. I think the psychiatrist at least got that right. But what he was amenable to was, was uh, safe containment in a, in a special hospital or prison. And there should be some recognition that there is this category of person who could be contained safely away from society. Humans have an almost infinite capacity and potential and variety. We can make ourselves a saint or we can make ourselves the most abject sinner, the most repulsive serial killer, but we make choices in our lives. No matter how few they are, we still retain that essential cognitive capacity to be responsible for our own behavior. No infant is going to grow into a serial killer if it is loved and nurtured and successful in life. In the next episode of Making a Monster the Tapes, we'll have the second part of our interview with Dr. Eric Cullen, where he talks more about his career as a psychologist and discusses the case of Rose West. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast and haven't watched the TV show yet, Crime and Investigation's Making a Monster continues with new episodes every Monday at 9pm. Let us know what you think. Leave a review in whichever podcast app you use or tag a post with hashtag Making a Monster on social media. You can also head to crimeinvestigation.co.uk for more information on the series and profiles on all the killers featured. Making a Monster The Tapes features interviews recorded by Monster Films for the Crime and Investigation TV series and was voiced by me, Cherry Healy, produced by Sam Pearson and Chloe Frost, with editing by Joel Porter. When a case becomes cold, it's the ultimate frustration. I never had another case quite like this. But do we surrender? 
Absolutely not. To commit a murder, you must at a minimum have the opportunity to do so. One of the major misconceptions about serial killers is that they are crazy. They are not crazy. It is, in many ways, the greatest show on Earth. It is humanity. New episodes of Homicide Hunter on Crime and Investigation.